So systemic illness is on the rise across America and sadly around the world and autoimmune disease becoming a more prevalent word in our vocabulary. And that sucks. But luckily today we are joined by someone that has not only overcome several chronic illnesses, but has also beaten the likes of infections like Lyme disease and C. diff, which is terrible. If you're not knowing what that is, Google it right now and it'll scare the crap out of you, I guarantee. So please welcome everybody to the podcast, Rebecca Farmer. And hey, if you're enjoying the podcast, make sure to hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you don't miss any of the amazing guests that we have coming up on the show. And with that, let's just jump right into it. I really don't know where to begin with your story because you've gone through so much stuff. I remember the first time I saw you, I saw a photo of, I believe it was yourself, probably at your lowest point. You were, I I believe you said 66 pounds, if that's correct. Yeah. And that was actually my lowest recorded weight. I have been smaller than that in the past. And so one thing that really caught me from those, uh, from those images compared to you now was um, a lot of people, when they see saw, would see that, would think, oh, this poor girl had an eating disorder. And me and Tommy here actually have had eating disorders. And so while I can relate to the image and probably the physical drag of being at that weight, you actually did mm-hmm. not have an eating disorder. You were dealing with a lot of chronic illnesses and bad C. diff. So maybe a good place to start with your journey is to kind of go back to the beginning and kind of how you gotten to where you are in a as short as you can make it because believe me it's a long story but it's well worth <laughs> it's well worth the listen so I'll hand it over to you Rebecca. So from a very young age I was diagnosed with malnutrition um, well osteoporosis and shortly after that I was also diagnosed with failure to thrive. Um, kept getting, I would get sick all the time. They would just put me on antibiotics. And um, in seventh grade, I came down with severe mood mood disorders. I developed these mood disorders. And this was after my family had moved to a brand new place. And I was already going through puberty. Um, So there was a lot of peer pressure at school and older guys were hitting on me. And I was, I was actually taping my boobs down at one point. Again, it wasn't an eating disorder. I just didn't want attention. It was really hard. Um, So depression, OCD, anxiety, narcolepsy, insomnia. I was not only diagnosed with all of those, but I was truly suffering from all of them. Um, The OCD and depression were very severe and narcolepsy as well. So I saw a psychiatrist and they put me on Adderall, clonazepam, and Ambien. And they said, yes, you can take these long term and no, they're not hard to get off of. So I ended up taking those for over 13 years. Um, I was sort of like a zombie, but they helped me to just get by and to function. Um, Near the end of high school, I ran into, I thought that I was having a heart attack. My parents rushed me to the emergency room and I was diagnosed with degenerative disc and Costco chondritis, which is inflammation of the chest tissue. And they pumped me full of morphine and said, go home and deal with your anxiety. Um, So that's what I continued to do. Um, They also put me on opioids, but I didn't take them because I literally couldn't function. I was a zombie. So um, I continued to take the meds until 2017 when it was right after wisdom tooth removal surgery and I believe it was the last straw for my gut because I had taken the antibiotics and pain meds that they gave to me for after the surgery. And after that, I, my central nervous system just totally crashed. Um, I was bed bound with suffocation and anxiety attacks, literally couldn't breathe. I was going to the emergency room on a regular basis. I was calling my mom and fiance at the time and my dad to come over to massage my body um, with a massager and with their own hands because it was like the only thing that I, it was the only way I could breathe. I would literally be so clenched. Like I was so tense and I couldn't, it was not just anxiety. It was my central nervous system crashing. 
Um, so that was, it was like, I can't keep taking these meds. They're not even working. That's when I decided to stop seeing the traditional medicine doctors and start seeing functional medicine doctors. I really became more strict. I was already doing a ketogenic diet. I've always eaten um, low carb and somewhat paleo, but I never, you know, tracked carbs or anything. I was just eating whole foods and my mom never gave us sugar or anything like that. Um, so that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to dial into this keto thing. And I knew what I was doing um, for the most part. And I tried to get off of my meds, which was a long process. The clonazepam was very difficult to get off of. And I was then diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. I was prohibited to work because I was so medically unstable. And the other functional medicine doctors, I was working with Lyme doctors and multiple functional medicine doctors. And they uncovered a plethora of autoimmune issues um, Hashimoto's, Addison's disease, and it just continued, you know, Raynaud's just one after another, after another. And it came to the point where nothing could surprise me anymore. Um, I was just like sort of numb and I fought that hard. And at, at some point I started to lose rapid amounts of weight and I was misdiagnosed with an eating disorder more times than I can count because I was saying, you know, I'm doing keto for relief of my autoimmune symptoms. I was dealing with non-epileptic seizures um, from the Lyme disease and I was truly bed bound. So I was doing like a four to one fat to protein ratio. And that was enough to give me hope, um, get me out of bed and my cognition continued to suffer. And so I was misdiagnosed many times. I was treated in an eating disorder unit because a nurse petitioned to have me sent there because I was doing keto. And my family was very, very scared for me. So they, they said, you know, if you try to check yourself out, then you won't have a roof over your head to come home to. So I, I was treated um, in the acute eating disorder unit for an entire month. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever been through. Um, but I don't regret it. I don't regret any of it. God has, you know, taught me so much through it and I've learned so much through it all. So after that, I, I put on 15 pounds in there, came home and I continued to lose weight. So this is when I was like, okay, I need to start tracking calendar or, um, calories to make sure I'm eating enough. I was eating 6,000 calories at one point and still losing weight. So finally, I was tested for C. diff, came back positive, and that was a relief. <laughs> That's when people started believing me, okay, you don't have an eating disorder. Um, so C. diff is a bad bacteria that takes over the good bacteria in your gut. I was resistant to all of the antibiotics. I had to go through 13 rounds of them before I was approved for a fecal transplant. Got that, was still testing positive. I was approved for a second fecal transplant and it went away. Um, but then it came back in a month and I, I could tell when it came back, it just takes over. Um, so I had a third fecal transplant and it still was giving me problems, still testing positive. And that's when they told me it has seeded in my gut and I ended up in another emergency room, the third emergency room back to back in May of 2019. And they were telling me I had to remove my colon and be hooked up to a feeding tube. And at this point, I was actually asking them to treat me in their eating disorder unit. But I couldn't because I had to be held in isolation because of the C. diff. I desperately needed someone to help me refeed. I was dealing with ulcerative colitis, involuntarily throwing up. Um, I couldn't handle it. My blood sugars were all over the place, hypoglycemia on a regular basis. Um, so in that emergency room, I spoke with the dietitian, and I said, you've got to let me do this all meat thing, which I had tried before. Um, but I only did the meat, beef, salt, and water, and I could never stick to it. I felt worse. 
So this time around, I just said, just let me eat all meat. There's something to it. And she allowed me that. And she put me in touch with the chef at the hospital in the, in the kitchen. And they were sending up multiple entrees of butter, meat, and hard boiled eggs. And I was hoarding that in the hospital room and eating that and throwing out the other tray, <clears throat> the other tray that they were sending up with carbs and these weight gainer drinks. Um, and immediately my blood sugars started to stabilize no more involuntary throwing up, um, the flare ups I was dealing with calmed. And one week later, I'm four pounds up for the first time in a long time. And they sent me home and said, go home and do your weird all meat diet. And I have not looked back since then. Um, so that is the summary. That's that's really a, a fascinating story. I mean, I've seen similar things in some of the carnivore communities where people have come from really extreme situations and all of a sudden they found, it's not, I don't want to say magic pill because I hate using that word or that phrase, yeah. but it, they see this extreme turnaround. Just, I mean, I, I always use Terry Walls as an example of diet and nutrition change, really changing someone from an extremely disabled state of being to now basically living in a thriving lifestyle. And besides the fact, you also have a, a bad A sticks t-shirt sticks with my first <laughs> concert <laughs> sticks with my first concert ever. Great. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> they were really That's Kansas awesome. state fair. Can't beat it. It was, they were playing with Kansas. I'm still not lucky, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really fascinating. I think something that me and Tommy can um, at least relate to with our, our, history of talking about eating yeah. disorders on here is kind of the dogma with eating disorders. And I was going to say one of the things that probably immediately pegged you in the eating disorder segment with the medical community, uh, besides the fact that you were low weight at the time, was simply that you were a woman. It, and, that's exactly what I was going to say, yeah. And it's yeah. really unfortunate that that's the level of depth that a, a, a majority of our medical community has with eating disorders is like very stereotypical um, mm. way of viewing it. And it's really unfortunate because you get people like yourself that are struggling with many other problems, don't have any eating disorders, not the center of the issue. And then you have people like me and Tommy who are guys that are struggling and we get dismissed get for being attention. guys. The thing, so, it really yeah. gets me, the thing that really gets me about it is you had to get to that really bad state for somebody to end up listening to you. It's quite shocking. Yeah. But it's amazing to kind of see how you've um, basically through your own will and uh, just drive have uh, kind of dug yourself out of this hole. And I was going to say one other, one other thing about, um, I can't ever pronounce the word right, but clonopin uh, and benzos, as people say, I was on clonopin uh, for the first bit of um, when I was starting to develop nerve problems this about a year and a half ago. Everyone thought I was just because mine wasn't showing up on nerve conduction studies because I have small fiber nerve damage. It doesn't show up on conventional testing. No one believed that I had any nerve problems at all. No one thought anything was wrong. All the blood work was good. And literally everyone basically was saying I was just being a hypochondriac and oh, had, I got that all and, the time. And oh, and I have OCD as well. So they're blaming it solely on and they weren't yeah, ever exactly. And the problem with that was, so they put me on clonopin, which thankfully I was only on for a month, which is still like longer than I think it's suggested to be on for like extended. Days. Yeah. Yeah. So my withdrawal wasn't as bad as many, but that is a nasty one to come off of any of the benzos. I, I, was, I, was, I was on it as well, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's basically just like a zombie. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was down to like a 16th of a pill and I still couldn't get off of it. It was crazy. The Adderall wasn't as hard as I thought it would be to get off of, but that the, uh, clonazepam and clonopin, yeah, it's hard. And I work with people now who are coming off of it and it's, it's hardcore. There's like a second wind of withdrawal symptoms that seems mm -hmm. to occur. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you didn't take it for like years on end. Now, one of the things that I think is really, I mean, as you found out, was that you 
you go through conventional medicine means not only do you get frustrated with the process because you have to see all these different specialists because everything is broken down into little dinky little things and they don't communicate with each other. And then you realize that they're not yeah. actually going to try and address the root cause of the problem. They're just going to mm -hmm. try and cover right. up what's expressing. And so I think it's kind of beautiful that you found con our functional medicine yeah. um, because I know people, they go for many, 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 many years and they still never find it. And they just end up suffering oh, yeah. more because of the things they're on and kind of goes back to what you were mentioning about OCD was I never really thought about my OCD as I just thought of it as something that I had and I may have a genetic right. component that plays into that, but what is the root cause on a chemical level that is causing those types of erratic behaviors? And that's something you kind of discovered in your healing journey was that as you switched over to this all meat diet, um, these tendencies probably drifted away. And that was probably one of the um, earlier things you noticed. So kind of yeah. something, something I wanted to talk about with you before I start ranting and raving forever uh, is uh, does meat heal? What have you seen? I, I should have mentioned early on, you work with, you, you, you help people dealing with these issues. Now you're a health coach and a life coach and you uh, help these people out. Tommy will be back in a second. I'm sure it's an internet connection thing. Um, but does meat heal? And what have you seen with your own clients that have been dealing with similar issues for years starting to transition over? Yes. So what's more important is understanding the mechanisms behind carnivore and keto. Um, so for me, a big thing was removing the anti-nutrients and eating meat, which is the most bioavailable form of nutrients. It's better than a feeding tube. Um, on top of that, animal fats help to heal and seal the gut. Animal foods are the most nutrient dense. Um, and then again, removing the anti-nutrients, which were binding to nutrients that I was trying, my body desperately needed to absorb. So that in and of itself is a miracle, I think. And the carnivore diet is it is the ultimate elimination diet. Um, there are no anti-nutrients in meat and it's pretty rare. Like I'm still, still yet to find someone who reacts to lamb, you know? Um, so there, there are a bunch of variables going on when someone decides to eat only meat. And when I work with people, uh, it really, really depends on the individual, what they need to heal. It works for mood disorders because when, you know, when we pull away sugar, it, we don't deal with oxidative stress, burning glucose as fuel actually creates oxidative damage. Um, so you hear people talk about, uh, antioxidants and red wine and chocolate and green tea. It's like, we don't even need those when we're not using glucose as fuel. Um, a lot of people that have chronic fatigue, maybe keto isn't the best thing long-term, but becoming fat adapted is so powerful because then you're metabolically flexible and you have the ability to burn fat as fuel or glucose. That metabolic flexibility means that you, you're so much more resilient. You don't depend, you don't have to, you know, eat every two hours or every four hours. Um, your blood sugar stabilize. When your blood sugar stabilize, your mood stabilizes. I, I'm one of those weird people that wakes up at five or five 30 in the morning because I feel fantastic and I have energy and I just go and go and go all day. And, and I sleep like a baby. These are all things I never, ever thought I would be that, you know, like you said, I thought it was just a part of me. I thought it was going to be forever, but epigenetics are a real thing. Changing our biochemistry is a real thing. Retraining our neurotransmitters. You know, I took, Adderall for 13 years, over 13 years. I had one doctor tell me that they were concerned that I may have, you know, burnt out my neurotransmitters for good, which actually means that they were oversaturated. And I have restored all of that. I do not suffer from OCD and it just gets better and better. Um, I noticed improvements in my mood and energy within the first two weeks. Just started talking with the mic off. That's um, really, 
really, I think that's something that's really fascinating because the first thing I noticed, so I started kind of on, I've, I've never really um, gone the full carnivore route. I'm trying to find some balance because of my eating disorder tendencies. I can easily flip mm -hmm. into like a really extreme mode. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I, I'm right now I'm working with a team that's kind of helping me um, kind of troubleshoot stuff until, so I can find a, a good mental balance with the, with the physical stuff. Because I will say the first thing I noticed was about a year and a half ago, I was somebody that um, didn't have any associated really chronic illnesses, but I, I had this really bad over-exercising problem and I was constantly just exhausted all the time. I was burning out my adrenals. I was, yeah. um, I was crashing by 4 p.m. I would, I would just be done. Like brain fog was setting in. I couldn't do work. I would, me, we'd be at the office with, uh, with my business partner and I would just be like ready to nap the rest of the day. I would walk home and like practically be collapsing on my way to my apartment because I was so tired. And the first thing I noticed when I started implementing um, some dietary changes and moving away from constantly eating like tons and tons of carbs, I was eating like 300 grams of oatmeal a day or no, 300 grams of carbs in oatmeal a day. Um, wow. I, I noticed that actually as I lowered my carbs to about 100 to sub 100, that area, my energy started to flatten out through the day because I wasn't doing this big spike in the morning and then having right. a crash. And so right. it really shows the level of control you can have with your own energy through dietary change, which I, I always thought that my problem was like, oh, maybe I'm not eating enough carbs because you grow up learning that carbs are the energy, uh, the energy macronutrient. So it's like your body needs glucose. And like you mentioned earlier, it's like your body doesn't necessarily need it. And it's actually more important to be metabolically flexible and to be able to switch on and off from that, which is a more, I would say, historically accurate thing we did as humans. And now- right that to the level of which we need to go to the extreme is different for everybody. Like probably a lot of people yes. you work with who are dealing with several different autoimmune diseases probably need to be more adherent to what you're trying to do with them. Um, carnivore wise than other people. So I, I the one thing I was going to ask you was kind of what level of um, I guess variety in their, in diets do you see most people need? Um, do you see more people needing a variety? Like, cause like you said, you felt crap on beef, water, salt. You actually needed to have that oh, variety yeah. of different cuts of meat. And you, I know that you've been experimenting with, uh, fat amounts. You started from a four to one fat to protein ratio. Now you're kind of going more protein cause you're feeling better on that. Cause you've reset your hormones and neurotransmitters. So maybe you could kind of go into that and kind of what you've been seeing with, um, clients and just your own experience with how your body changes over that healing curve. Yeah. So before I get into that, I admire you for recognizing that strict carnivore is too, um, too restrictive for you. You know, if I'm working with someone, even if they have severe autoimmune issues, it's going to work against them if they're feeling restricted, if there's some eating disorder mindset or even orthorexia, um, technically that's not an eating disorder, but it is a problem and it can be a problem. Um, so there's, that's always the first thing to consider that precedes diet. If that's a problem, then we're going to figure out how to add in some variety like keto foods that are lower in the anti-nutrients and see what works best for them. Um, but as far as variety within the carnivore diet, most people appreciate variety um one because you know there are only only so many sources of fat in the animal kingdom and a lot of people don't do so well with dairy so um, it's good to have multiple different ways to get in your fat it doesn't just have to be butter what if you don't do well with butter we've got beef suet bone marrow so many other things that people aren't even aware of um, and then as far as the types of meat that you're eating for me Organ meats, just total game changer. I love them. It's variety. It's fun. Um, all, all beef is, I actually find sometimes more hurtful than helpful. Um, I think that it's important to have a, a balance of the different amino acids that we find in proteins. Um, like egg whites are 
more on the glucogenic side um, as far as their amino acid profile. So even little things like that can make a difference, but just as far as making this a lifestyle, um, you've got to think outside the box. You know, I have a carnivore brownie recipe. I have carnivore ravioli. Um, these things are what makes it fun for me. And I, I don't look forward to my next meal. I used to just revolve my life around my next meal. I'm mm -hmm. not like that anymore. I do not have food addiction. However, I still enjoy my food. I enjoy cooking. I love making things phenomenal, you know, and you can do that with meat. And um, some people choose to do meat uh, spices and herbs. And guess what? You don't have to stay away from all of them. There are low oxalate spices. And it's just about being mindful of the mechanisms and why we're avoiding anti-nutrients and finding what works best with your body, which is truly different for each person, depending on what they're going through. Um, and as people are healing, yes, a lot of people do need to keep it pretty simple in the beginning. Um, but when I say simple, there's still so much wiggle room. And that's sometimes that's just the big aha moment that I have with clients, new clients, you know, our first session, they're like, I didn't know I had all these options. Um, and they don't need to be as extreme as they thought. And it's realizing that that can do so much good when you're relaxed and enjoying what you're eating. And in the back of your head, you're not thinking, you know, this is only for 30 days. Um, and as people heal, they're able to reintroduce so many things. I, I had a client who she had hot, you know, huge hives on a regular basis major issues, autoimmune issues, thyroid issues. By the end of our six months together, we, she was thriving. She could eat an apple. She was eating all sorts of different foods and no hives. Her digestion was regular again. Her thyroid is looking better. I mean, her everything, so many things changed for her. Um, and that was just so cool to see that someone's, you know, able to do something like paleo and not react and be again, that metabolically flexible state. And she wasn't craving sweets or anything. Um, so things like that do happen. It evolves with the healing. It's different for each person. That's, I'm, I think that's really well stated. I mean, they do say variety is the spice of life. And I think <laughs> that in a lot of ways it is, but it's the way you kind of have to, it's kind of a methodical practice when you're working through um, certain physiological struggles um, because they always say variety is, is good, especially for your gut microbiome. But when your gut is completely messed up and you have leaky gut and all these things, you really got to go back to a baseline. Yeah. And we'll kind of touch on that in a second because I think leaky gut and gut health is really important. But I don't know if Tommy had anything you wanted to jump in on here really quick. No, I think that is absolutely great. I think it's really tailoring it to, to the person. I think that's something we've always talked about doing what's best for you, really. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I wanted to kind of get into is because I we've talked about anti-nutrients yeah. a ton mm -hmm. uh, in probably especially a bunch of our podcasts, especially <laughs> you. You were the one that actually brought up anti-nutrients to me the very first time about oxalates. And I was mm -hmm. like, what is this stupid crap? And I basically just kept eating spinach. But I wanted to talk about, I kind of wanted your, your view on kind of um, how big a deal is it with anti-nutrients in people's diets? How bad can it be? And also, how do you uh, kind of navigate doing that elimination and then reintroduction to kind of see yeah. what works for you, you know? It's big. I thought that Sally Norton was a total quack. You know, I actually spoke with her on the phone. And even after that conversation, I was like, yeah, okay. I'll still, it was baby spinach for me. Um, I actually introduced baby spinach after two weeks on the carnivore diet when my mood and improvement was picking up. I was like, I can, I can reintroduce something keto that's, you know, super safe. My ankles were so swollen the next day, I couldn't put on my own shoes. Um, and I experienced oxalate dumping and it's like sand in my eyes. And I still get it if I do. You know, sometimes we'll have a spice, a seasoning that has black pepper in it. Um, and there are so many superfoods that are loaded with oxalates, turmeric, cinnamon, black pepper, 
baby spinach. Um, and it does affect me. It affects many people. Um, skin rashes, mood disorders. Uh, I had a client who had really bad internal cystitis her entire life. And she couldn't have sex with her partner, her husband. She was in pain every time she urinated. Removing the oxalates was one of the biggest things that we, that we did. She noticed improvement like right away. Um, and I see things like this happen all the time. So, but I also believe that it depends on the state of your gut. And this is just my theory. Um, Sally Norton is the expert on oxalates. But what I have found is that it depends on the state of your gut. There are some people that tolerate them much better than others. Um, and as I continue to heal, I know my gut's in a good place because I, I didn't tolerate things like that before. Um, and I don't have as severe reactions. Um, so it's an individual thing. I like the way that Sally puts it. She says that oxalates are a poison and we each tolerate different amounts of this poison, just like alcohol. I can't touch alcohol. Um, well, at least I couldn't, you know, the last time I tried it, I was like drunk after like four sips of an 8% beer. It was so embarrassing. I was on a date. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a different level for each person, but if you're struggling with something, it's totally worth it to experiment removing them. So we have phytates, lectins, and oxalates. And it just makes sense to remove what could be binding to our nutrients. Um, and for me, it was such a very clear picture because I was so emaciated. I desperately needed those nutrients. So um, it's just such a good picture of how bioavailable meat is and how we don't even need, we don't even need micronutrients from vegetables. We can get that from liver. I mean, if you look at the nutrients in beef liver compared to kale or some other superfood, it's ridiculous. Um, so that's another thing that really, you know, everyone, I get that a lot is, you know, where do I get my vitamins and my nutrients? And it's just, it's, it's sad that there is such mis misinformation out there. Yeah, that was something that we talked about when we had Judy Cho on um, yes. a little oh. while ago was um, kind of the sort of dogma around certain certain ways of eating. And I just see the world moving into a more plant. I mean, I see it on my Google recommended all the time. I don't know why it, recommended, why it recommends it to me because I Google carnivore stuff like 90% <laughs> more than anything that has to do with plant-based. But I always get these plant-based articles about about Same. nutrient density they're pushing and, it so hard and when well, I, was, look, I was vegan for four years so yeah and so that's why oh, i was wow. going to talk about i was going to talk about gut stuff because we i mean when we've gone through eating disorders you put yourself through really bad gastric distress mm -hmm. anyways and when yeah. tommy you went recovery uh, into recovery with veganism then all of a sudden you're just pouring in and i did it too with mm -hmm. oatmeal and all this stuff i'm just pouring myself in with 80 90 70 to 100 grams of fiber a day and i'm just, easily that amount <laughs> oh, yeah and it's just and it's just like i can just imagine on the inside of my intestines this like like war zone of food passing through i, I won't describe it anymore if we have a the, da the damage i've done to my, my gut my digestive system up until this day is still really really bad i'm I find that if I add in certain plant foods into my diet again, I just get back to square one, really. And and I've noticed yeah. it as well when I eat when I eat certain, um, especially sulfur foods. If I eat certain sulfur mm -hmm. foods, it really like eggs, eggs and things like that. Yeah, I get like, mad, I get mad bloated, and it's really nasty. So I kind of want to talk mm -hmm. about gut health, um, and that's something that we've kind of alluded to a little bit up until now. But I wanted to kind of talk about you've experimented uh, a lot with bone broth, um, especially in your recovery journey. And I know you had some issues with histamines and a lot of people have issues with histamines, whether they have mast cell or just natural uh, histamine intolerance, which I have as well. And but you also have kind of talked about the importance of bone broth in that healing curve for your gut. So I kind of wanted to See, pick your brain on your thoughts around histamine and bone broth, but its importance to gut healing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? My camera is frozen on my end. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. 
It's frozen. Yeah, okay. But can you hear? Okay. <laughs> um, so histamine intolerance is for anyone that doesn't know, it's actually a good thing. Um, our, we produce histamines when we basically have healing messengers that are sent to a damaged tissue in our bodies, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. So if someone's dealing with severe histamine intolerance, be encouraged that your at least your body is sending those healing messengers. So that being said, I think it's very important to address the root. Where is that damaged tissue? Um, and I really, I work with people to address systemic healing. It involves your central nervous system, your immune system, and your hormones. Um, and so each person deals with a different level of histamine intolerance. If you're having a reaction, you know, if you're having hives or heart palpitations, then I don't think it's wise to keep doing something that's giving you that, even if it's bone broth. I do not think that bone broth or even meat broth is essential or critical, I should say. Um, I do think it's extremely helpful. And for me, I decided to keep having it. I was making meat broth intuitively, actually. I was using chicken feet and pig ears instead of bones because I, I definitely felt better with that. Um, and, but I would still, I would get a runny nose. My nose would start dripping like almost immediately. I knew it was histamine, but I didn't have any other symptoms. There were other things that caused more severe symptoms. So I decided to keep doing it because I felt strongly that it was good for me. And so it, it is very individual. Um, if it's something that is upsetting you or upsetting your central nervous system, if it truly feels like a trigger, then don't worry about it. Eat enough animal fat. That, that helps to heal your gut. There are many other things that contribute to healing your gut. Um, bone broth is fantastic, but it's not needed. And if your body is telling you clearly it, it doesn't like it, then listen. No, I think, I mean, that's one message that I hear you preach um, a lot about on your page is bio-individuality and how important that is. I remember, because um, you've spoken to some people that are vegan and stuff on that on your own, on yeah. your own uh, Instagram. And I really like the level of, or sorry, lack thereof of dogma that comes from the mm -hmm. things you talk about. And I love that you recognize that everyone has this difference. So I, I kind of wanted... Uh, to hear your thoughts on what do you what do you think about people or, or what do you think about plant based vegetarianism and veganism? Like, can people thrive on that long term? Are some people are, are some people just built okay to do that, or is it more of like you can do it short term and then you got to mix it up a little bit? I kind of just I would see love Tommy to smiling. He's like, I tried I know. it. <laughs> I know. I, I, just, I just love to see his face when I bring up the words. That's the only yeah, why me I do too. it. That was powerful right there. Um, so I do. I work with some people. I, actually, one of my close girlfriends here is vegan. And it's for her own personal reasons. And so I'm still able to work with her. And I helped her to optimize towards a more ketogenic vegan diet. She lost so much weight. She looks phenomenal. Her energy is better. However, um, I hope she is okay with me sharing this, but she is struggling hardcore with energy. And um, for a while she had to really get creative about getting enough protein. So there are a lot of things that I would say you got to be mindful of if you're embarking on this vegan or vegetarian journey. Um, and I think that supplements are necessary and you've got to mix up your different sources of protein to even find a complete pro uh, amino acid pro um, protein. And um, so my, my answer is yes, I do think there are some people who can thrive on a vegetarian diet. I know people that can thrive on a standard American diet. <laughs> okay. But the majority of us, need animal foods because that's where that's where the good stuff is we need those nutrients and i have not worked with anyone or known anyone yet who has been long-term vegan who has not experienced issues um, i just did a podcast with someone who is vegan and she you know she was interviewing me and after we recorded she she was 
Like I, I am struggling with this. I am struggling with that. And I get that a lot where they confess or they confess. I actually binged on pork, you know, the other night, or I had to get a steak because I was so fatigued. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the agenda for the vegan propaganda and all this stuff is real. Mm -hmm. And I, people need to be aware of that. When I see the plant-based burgers, the beyond burger, I literally flip it backwards. I'll cover it up with real meat. Yeah. I, I get very irritated with that because they're acting like this is a better replacement and they're putting so much crap in those products. That's my other issue is they're putting, you know, seed oils and all of these other things. If it were just plant-based, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. It's that they're telling people this is more healthy than buying some ground beef that has nothing added to it. And it's got all of these processed chemicals and there's hardly anything that's real food inside of it. It just really drives me nuts. And then people want to say there's no propaganda. You've got to be kidding me. Um, I, I think so, yeah. that I think that's a really big um, pro I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday that was like getting into the beyond beyond meat kind of patty stuff. And I was just like, oh, boy, do I do I warn him? Do I warn him right. about this? how far do I push? Because it's like my thought with that stuff is like, if you're going to pretend to eat meat, you might as well just eat meat. Cause, I know. <laughs> cause, yeah, you're, you're just imitating the taste really because you really do crave meat. Whether you, you consciously know that or not, that your body is actually crying out for it. Right. Yeah. I accidentally ordered some vegan pork rinds once. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I gave it. them away on Facebook okay. Marketplace. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> But you brought up something that was really, um, I think, really important uh, that I wanted to talk about really quickly, and that was seed oils. And that was something yeah. that you said was found. That's, in the that's exactly what I was going to say, yeah. And seed oils, as you know, Rebecca, I'm preaching to the choir here. Over the last 75 to 100 years, I believe Crisco, I don't want to say it came out in the early 1900s, but I think mm -hmm. it did, somewhere around there. I remember seeing old right. ads for it. But ever since then, we've had this escalation in seed oil use, decrease in red meat. We basically followed the dietary guidelines mm -hmm. pretty closely. Right. I think 60% yeah. of people are coherent. Um, yet we've seen this increase in systemic illness, uh, especially metabolic diseases, which hypertension, diabetes, um, name it, uh, it's a lot of them. But I kind of wanted to talk about with you um, kind of the dangers of these seed oils, especially when you're combining it with a high carbohydrate intake that is recommended in the, in, in, in the dietary guidelines. Yeah. I mean, seed oil is, I think, you know, it drives me crazy because they also have keto foods mm -hmm. with a lot of it. There are these easy keto things and it's like, why did you have to mm -hmm. throw that in there? Um, it's probably more affordable to make. Um, but seed oils have a half-life of 680 days. So anytime you're eating something with a seed oil, it's going to be embedded into your cells. It causes inflammation to the brain and the body, you know, so that means mood disorders um, or if you're having body aches, I know that it can affect your nerves as well. And that's going to be in your body for at least 680 days. That's mm. a really powerful statement. Yeah. And um, I am probably still recovering from the keto treats that I had with seed oils. Um, near the end there, I was really struggling with binging. Um, you know, the sight of my own emaciated body was very triggering. So I was getting all these easy to eat keto foods and I would just try to eat as much as possible. And a lot of them were great, but they had those seed oils. And um, so combining that with glucose, you can just imagine the level of inflammation. That's the main thing is it's inflammation. And that looks different. It doesn't just mean, you know, oh, my back hurts. Inflammation is a mood thing, too. It can be depression. It can be bipolar. It's, you know, look at what it does to your body. It does the same thing in your brain. And they are uh, very addictive. I, I think that they also you know, they're, they're made to be hyper palatable. And I can tell when I, if I were to accidentally eat a seed oil, I can tell I, I tried some keto ice creams during COVID 
and one of them had gluten and it was crazy. It was, I, I couldn't stop eating it. I was like, Whoa, this one's really good. There's something special about this one. Sure enough. I go back to the store to get it again. And I'm like, this has gluten in it. It was like banana cream pie or something. And I was like, why would they put this in there? And that's, you know, our bodies become addicted to these things that are manipulated to be addictive and they're not good for us. They use canola oil in Canada as gas for their cars. (laughs) And we're putting this inside of our bodies on a regular basis. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is something that uh, boggles my mind. (laughs) But no, uh, I relate to the ice cream craving, though, because I used to be, oh, man, I could I could pound through one of those like keto ice cream things and just like never stop. They were so good. When I was in the binging days. I couldn't even I could not buy just one flavor, you guys. Like, (laughs) seriously, I I can say this now because I'm not struggling at all. But it was like, I'm just going to allow myself one. And there was, I would end up with like seven different flavors around me in, in the chair, just plop myself down. I'm going to watch Netflix and eat all of these, you know. Um, and it's not, I'm so happy to not be in that place anymore. That wasn't long ago. And that's, it's so cool how the binging has changed fairly quickly. I mean, it got so bad that I almost died in a car accident during a binge episode. And, um, and this was doing keto, relatively clean keto, seriously. And now I just, I, some days I'm like, I don't even feel like eating. And I force myself to eat because I know I need it. I work out hard, but I don't, I do not have the same relationship with food. I have true food freedom and everyone deserves to experience that. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's a good kind of jumping off uh, point for this next uh, topic. One thing I want to talk about is when you're, I keep saying that. One thing I wanted to talk about, I need to learn a new phrase. I don't think we I mean, noticed until you said that. <laughs> yeah, I just noticed it every time. But anyway, one thing I wanted to talk about was kind of when you're working with a client, um, I know that everyone's starting from a different base level. And I know that's when, or or, Tommy, when you work with eating, eating disorder, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, clients, everyone's starting from a different base level. They all require different, different care needs at different times, but just to the, the general public out there that may be looking at this kind of way of eating animal-based eating, I'll call it. What is some good first steps someone can take to kind of ease, ease into it? If, if you don't know anything about them, their background, what are some just things that they should look into to start making that first step into improving their overall health? Um, mindset, first of all, be honest with yourself. Do you suffer from an eating disorder? And do you suffer from over concern about the quality of your food? You know, I mentioned orthorexia earlier. I struggled with that. Um, and that's what they pinned me with in the eating disorder unit. When I said, look, I've got C. Um, I didn't know it's about C. diff yet. I said, I had auto autoimmune disease. That's why I'm doing this. Um, but they diagnosed me with orthorexia because I was very particular about certain foods because I knew I had a real reaction. I mean, they told me that gluten was just all in my head, but, um, Um, I just lost my train of thought. What is the question? Oh, I was asking what are some first steps someone can do to kind of, Oh yeah. 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 So thank you. Um, you know, identify what you're dealing with in the mind and also address, are there environmental issues? You know, how is your support system? Are you isolating Mm -hmm. yourself? Have you tried to reach out? Um, there's so many different lifestyle and behavioral changes that we fail to make. And then we just, we look for that, that magic pill. And that's an issue. Um, And then if you're interested in, in addressing your nutrition, um, do your research. It's very simple to do a Google search of the nutrients in beef liver versus kale. And that right there can make all the difference in, in, you know, what you're going to believe and worry about. 
um, consider working with someone for some direction. I, you know, a lot of my clients are just, it's just to hold their hand and walk alongside them. They had, they had the intuition, they had the hunch, they just needed someone to, you know, help them understand the mechanisms that I keep mentioning. It's, it's why these things work. So don't put yourself in a box. That's, that's something that one of my rheumatologists Mm -hmm. told me is, um, you have something that you should not be put into a box or labeled after being mislabeled by so many doctors. He said that to me and it meant so much because it's the truth. We can't label ourselves with one thing. And when we do that, we create boundaries that are unhelpful. So going into it, just be open-minded and do it in a way that is sustainable for you. If all beef, salt, and water is feels restrictive, you know, beyond a little bit of a hurdle, then don't do it. Consider eating other meats, at least start somewhere, you know, um, like I allowed myself dairy and stevia in the beginning, because that's what I had to do to not feel restricted. And, um, yeah, give yourself time also. I know that's sort of a lot of tips, but, um, it's, it's a, really amazing thing if you can just pull away from those foods that you feel you depend on and maybe you do depend on them you give your body a chance to heal when you remove the interference so if you think about it that way it becomes easier no that's i think that you brought up a really uh, powerful statement there about having really being in the right mental place and so i think a good place to kind of tail end this podcast would be talking about the importance for you in finding yeah. spirituality and stuff that can ground you, whether that is religion or some people it's nature, music. I've been some, that's something that I've been searching for recently. I know Tommy has been talking a lot on our page about mindfulness and meditation and finding Obviously, that religion as well for me over some Christians. So yeah, but kind of um, mm-hmm. talk about the role of, of finding that spirituality that held you grounded and, how important that is to the journey. I wouldn't have given carnivore another chance in that hospital room if it weren't for a true conviction, because in the back of my head, I knew I was addicted to those keto foods. And that was God twisting my arm and saying, I want you to let go of this thing that you thought you were going to do for the rest of your life, because it did help with the Lyme disease. And I just, I decided this is what I'm going to do forever. That was my OCD, you know, like control. I want to know what I'm going to do forever. This is the answer. And I had to learn how to be open-minded and flexible and, and sensitive to what God was putting on my heart. And I felt a true conviction that I had to do it again, but this time with more grace, you know, God gives us critical thinking skills. I didn't have to do what everyone in the Facebook groups said, you know, just beef, salt, and water. I didn't have to do that. And I, I was just so hard on myself for so long. And I, I would have found healing much sooner if I hadn't been so, um, so rigid. And again, that's, that was about learning grace and seeing myself through the eyes of Christ in the way that I identify with him, not the way that I am hard on myself and critical of myself. And I would still suffer from that if I didn't identify with Christ. Um, faith is, faith is an amazing catalyst to healing. If, if you're doing all the right things, but you don't have real faith, you could definitely hold yourself back, you know? Um, and Gratitude practice is huge. That's something that I've also gratitude and affirmations. Um, It's changed my life. I had a spiritual mentor give me this affirmation booklet um, when I met with him. And I said, you know, I'm just, I'm really sick. I'm struggling. I don't feel well. And he's like, I can tell that you're not reading your Bible by the way you're talking right now. And it was a slap in the face um, because I really was feeling horrible. But it, even the way that we speak is so powerful um, beyond what people realize. There's a, there's a study about people that 
took people from the Holocaust and the Vietnam veterans, and they hooked up blood pressure cuffs to them, and they asked them to think about the worst thing that they went through. Their blood pressure stayed the same, cortisol stayed the same, and then they asked them to talk about the worst thing that they went through, and they had stroke levels of high blood pressure. That's the power of words. Okay, <laughs> so when you start doing affirmations and speaking truth and healing over yourself, that's what I do for an hour when I wake up at 530 in the morning. I sit in my sauna and I meditate and I listen to God and I pay attention to what's going on in my mind. Mind, where the mind goes, the man follows. Um, and I, I stole that from Joyce Meyer. I didn't make that up, but it's so good. Um so all of this stuff, it matters. And it's so easy to slack with it because we have all of these quick fixes and um, you, you can't cut corners if you really want to heal at the root. That's, that is, that's a beautiful way to kind of end this one out because I think that's probably the most important tip out of yeah. all the podcasts we have done has been really getting your mind in the right place. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's the simplest thing to say, but it's one of the hardest things to do yes. for anybody out there. And I am definitely one of those people I've always been. I, I mean, Tommy, you relate to this. I shouldn't just say me. So many people are negative self talkers that I always say, you know, I'm broken. And in truth, you know what, you're not, you're not you're not broken. You have things that you need to work on. And that's just an, no matter where anyone's at, everybody has those things that you got to work it's on. It's just like we talk about often. It's about you do the rewiring your thought patterns. That's what it's all about. And yeah, it's a no journey. That, it's a journey, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, everybody, I highly recommend checking out uh, Rebecca Absolutely. here on her Instagram. It is, I think it's uh, tailored keto health. Is that correct? That's right. My name's not Taylor. <laughs> well, right. I've, I've right. just followed the note just now, actually. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you can reach out to her there. She does awesome uh, coaching with her clients. And I would highly recommend just, just following her page and kind of keeping up with her journey. Is there anything you would like to add to that, Rebecca, at the end where people can find you? Oh, no, that's you can find me through there. I'm, all my links are there in the, in the link in that Instagram um i just really appreciate you guys having me on you guys are both awesome and i'm up for a repeat anytime you guys Absolutely. are really cool I was and just I going to suggest that doing. actually <laughs> yeah oh yeah, i appreciate I it i would love to yeah you know there's never enough time in an hour to talk about the like we could do a whole thing on just just affirmation and i totally agree and i don't get to talk about all mm -hmm. this as much it's usually just you know my story so I need you guys to know this is such a blessing, like so heartwarming for me. It's so good to be able to get into this, dig, dig into the nitty gritty. And um, you guys are awesome. Well, thank you again, Rebecca. And we Thanks will see y'all, as my friend says, in the next one.